I'm Blake Golden. I am a head and neck cancer surgeon here at Swedish. I primarily, primarily operate a few blocks away at First Hill, but over here as well. We're gonna talk about cricothyroidotomy today. Um, they asked me to give this talk because I'm one of these guys who takes care of disaster airways. Um, I will confess to you that this is not an operation that I perform typically, a cricothyroidotomy. I am the guy who gets the cricothyroidotomy patient after it's been put in emergently in the field or in the emergency department. When I do a surgical airway, it's different from this, but if you are in the field or in the ER or at the bedside in the ICU and the patient needs an emergency airway access, this is a good place to start, and we'll talk about why. Um, I'll keep it pretty informal. You guys bust in with questions if you need to. I'll be around for the lab portion of this here in a little while afterwards, so if you wanna save questions till later and ask me then, totally your call. All right, so uh, emergency crike. It's relatively simple, it's fast, and it has a lower periop complication rate than a slash tracheostomy. I'll explain the difference between those two things, a slash tracheostomy and a cricothyroidotomy when we get to kind of the procedural slides here a little bit later on. But in general, it is thought to be the simplest, safest way to surgically access the airway in an emergency. The cricothyroid membrane is only separated um, from the skin by a little bit of fat, the medial edges of the strap muscles, which are not very vascular, and some fascia. There can be anterior jugular veins, sort of low flow veins here in the midline of the neck um, that you can get into as you put the crike in. Um, that's about the only vascular structure, but most of the time there's very little dangerous right in the midline of the neck. The vocal cords are situated about a centimeter above the cricothyroid membrane. So people worry about injuring the voice. If this is done properly, you won't damage the voice or the vocal cords at all. I'll show you guys that on some anatomy slides in a minute. So relative contraindications are age less than 10 years. The cricothyroid membrane is quite small. The cartilages are very soft and difficult to palpate on kids this young. Um, severe neck trauma with an inability to palpate landmarks because it's difficult for you to sort of elegantly access specific anatomy when the neck is all swollen and expanding, or pre-existing subglottic disease. So if the patient has a known tumor or a narrowing or severe um, scarring of the area below the vocal cords, putting in a cricothyroidotomy, it might not be successful because you might make your cut, try to enter the airway, and you just run into a block of scar. Again, it's nice to be able to take a good history and physical, but oftentimes when this is being done, it's being done for emergent reasons in the field. All right, so these, so I went to medical school, and when you go to medical school, you have to buy a Frank Netter anatomy textbook, and that oftentimes will follow you around the rest of your career, which is what mine did. So these are from my textbook that I bought when I was a first year medical student. Um, so this is the larynx with all the soft tissue stripped away. So we've got, I don't know, is there a pointer on this thing? Oh, wow. Fancy. Uh, so we have, we have a few landmarks here, okay? So... This is uh, anterior posterior view of the larynx. This is a side view of the larynx with the larynx and uh, proximal trachea sort of bisected. So a few landmarks here to identify. So here's the hyoid bone. This is the bone that you won't find on a skeleton unless they attach it with wires. This bone doesn't have a joint, doesn't articulate to any other bone in the body. Um, it attaches to the base of tongue musculature and the strap musculature and some soft tissue attached to the larynx. Right below that, we have the thyroid cartilage. This is where uh, the Adam's apple resides. So in men, the thyroid cartilage makes this little sort of hook forward and makes it more prominent. So this would be the next most prominent lump that you would feel in the midline of the neck. It's built like a big shield and it houses the vocal cords. And as we move down, the cricoid cartilage is next. The cricoid cartilage is the only circumferential cartilage of the airway. So it's the only one that makes a full circle. And it will be fairly prominent, at least in the skinny neck, right below the Adam's apple. Between those two is this relatively avascular cricothyroid membrane that we'll be talking about putting a hole in an airway in. And then below the cricoid cartilage are the tracheal rings all the way down to the carina. As we look at this in sort of lateral view here, you can see um, the epiglottis here on the inside. That's the cartilaginous flap that covers the vocal cords when you swallow. We go down inside the thyroid cartilage. These are the arytenoid cartilages. These are the joints that the vocal cords turn on. Here's the vocal cords going out to the front of the thyroid cartilage. And you see there's about a centimeter separation between the bottom of the thyroid cartilage and the vocal cords and the membranes right here below them. 
So how do you do this? There's seven or eight steps that you'll be doing kind of in a hurry if you ever get called upon to do one of these. So you want to palpate the landmarks, stabilize the upper airway with a non-dominant hand, make a midline vertical skin incision and make the incision big, and then you palpate your landmarks through the incision, you incise the membrane, you dilate, and you put the tube in. Okay, that's the whole presentation. I'll see you guys in the lab. I'm just kidding. We've got a lot of talk here. Uh, so the first step, you'll palpate the landmarks. So the landmarks that we just went over. So you'll feel in, you know, at a minimum, you want to feel for the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage. Um, on real fluffy, um, generous necks, sometimes it's difficult to feel these things through the skin. Once the skin incision's made, sometimes you'll get a better sense of what's going on because you can reach through the skin fascia and subcutaneous fat to feel with your fingertip. Uh, so you palpate the landmarks. You stabilize the upper airway with non-dominant hand. Do we have any left-handed people in the room? Everyone step out into the hall right now who's left-handed. So for a right-handed surgeon, you would use your left hand and you would sort of grab the airway with your elbow up towards the top of the patient's head. This lets you hold the airway still in the neck. If you're left-handed, you're gonna use your right hand to grab the airway and stabilize things in the neck. That's a pretty vital thing. Like I said, you'll be doing this fast without visualization of all these structures, so having things still and in the midline with tactile feedback is very important. Um, then you make a vertical skin incision in the midline and make this generous. You know, this is being done for emergent, life-saving reasons. We can debate the cosmesis of a large vertical midline skin incision after the patient has a safe airway and is not desaturating. Um, so you make it generous. And so, you know, like I said, I don't do cricothyroidotomy. I do um, emergent tracheostomies, but when I make the incision, I make it big. And so I'm talking about something like basically from the Adam's apple down to well below the trachea, okay? Then you palpate through the incision, and at a minimum, you're going to want to try and feel the thyroid cartilage, the bottom of the thyroid cartilage, and the cricoid cartilage. And you'll know that the gap between those two is your avascular plane that you can enter the airway in through safely. So that'll be your cricothyroid membrane. And then the next set of steps can be different depending on what equipment you have at the bedside. So sometimes you'll have just a basic surgical set with a knife and some scissors and a hemostat. Um, sometimes you'll have a prefabricated cricothyroidotomy kit available to you and basically those will have some basic surgical instruments and some dilators and trocars and things like that. So these next steps are just for sort of a general surgical instrument setup here. Um, You'll incise the membrane, and the membrane is wider horizontally than it is vertically. So you make a generous incision through the membrane, basically from one edge of the cricoid cartilage over to the other edge of the cricoid cartilage. Um, you'll dilate with a hemostat or a Kelly clamp or whatever sort of uh, ratcheting dilator that you have on hand to stretch things open. And you can dilate cephalocaudad, you can dilate later laterally, whichever you want to do. And then you'll insert a tube. So this is the cricothyroidotomy tube. It is a very, very narrow, small caliber tracheostomy tube, basically, is what it is. These are uncuffed tubes, so they don't have a balloon on the end of them. So they're not designed for long-term ventilation. This is purely for emergency ventilation. And then you have the aftermath. So you did this in a hurry. You didn't stop bleeding as you went. Um, you were trying to save the patient's life. So basically what you do is you get the patient's airway established. You get them ventilated and oxygenating. There's a collar that will come with these kits that you put through little flanges on the side and tie around to secure it so it doesn't pop back out. And then you control bleeding either by packing it off with hemostatic agents or holding pressure until help gets there to help you tie things off. Um, the cannula that is put in with a cricothyroidotomy is not a permanent airway. This is a temporary airway. And so what we try to do is transition these to a more sort of safe, stable, semi-permanent airway access for the patient, either by just taking them to the operating room, intubating them from above, past the cricothyroidotomy, and once an endotracheal tube's in place, you take the crack tube out and let the hole close, or going to the operating room and transitioning the crack to a formal tracheostomy. And that just kind of depends on what they got the airway placed for. Was it placed just because you were in the field and you didn't have intubation equipment and you had to put it in in a hurry? That patient can just have an endotracheal tube put in and they let this close on its own. Was it put in for some massive facial trauma or angioedema where the person's gonna need you know, some sort of neck access for a couple of weeks, then it'd be transitioned to a tracheostomy, which is a little more permanent. So it just kind of depends on the clinical situation there. That's cricothyroidotomy. 
What questions can I answer for you guys? Um, I just have a quick question. On with a, this procedure, do you also have the high risk of maybe cutting into the thyroid ima artery compared to like a tracheotomy? So the thyroid ima artery comes from below. Um, it's typically a sort of medium caliber arterial feeder that comes off of the anominate artery, but it typically is below. You're usually going to be well above the thyroid isthmus at this point. If you get into it, you just hold pressure. Hold pressure until help gets there. <laughs> but yeah, no, that, that's not a real concern with this one.